Well, um, uh, I'm extremely sorry that I couldn't be there in uh, in a person this time because of some uh, uh, some difficulties on 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 the set. Um, the uh, 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 most of my my uh, friends and colleagues who there know the, the ICTP is one of my favorite places, and this school is one of my favorite places to uh, lecture at. Too. So. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that at least we managed to uh, 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 get one thing um, uh, presented in this way. We'll see uh, how it works. Now, um, I know that this is a, this is a, a, a school on more uh, formal topics in, uh, in, uh, uh, in theoretical physics. Um, my original intention, uh, given that the LHC is uh, uh, starting back up imminently, was to give a series of lectures on um, on hadron collider physics, just the most basic uh, aspects of hadron collider physics. Um, so, uh, if you're a, a string theorist or a formal quantum field theorist or a cosmologist, uh, someone who doesn't spend their uh, their their lives thinking about uh, hadron collider physics, you would have some idea of um, of uh, the basics of what's going on. Uh, this is a general subject, uh, how to think about uh, collider physics, that was uh, part of a bread and butter education of a particle physicist maybe 30 years ago. Um, but uh, you don't find it presented so much in uh, textbooks anymore, and it's really perfect for a school. Um, so that's, that's what I was uh, uh, planning on doing. Um, but um, given that I, I couldn't be there uh, in person, uh, and I, I hate giving computer talks, period, and uh, the whole purpose of uh, uh, the, the, the point of the lectures I had in mind was to sort of slowly present this, uh, slowly present the subject um, from the ground up. I'm not going to be able to do that, um, but I will do something else instead uh, in this one lecture. Uh, I will still give you a, a more quickly a broad overview of um, uh, how to think about uh, collisions at the LHC and also what to expect for this year and for the next few years, uh, since uh, this is very likely going to be the most important uh, 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 period. The next couple of years are likely going to be the most important and exact period in the running of the LHC, at least as far as probing for physics beyond the standard models. Um, and uh, after that, what I want to actually tell you about, uh, which is something which is more reasonable uh, uh, to be done with a computer talk like this, uh, uh, especially given that uh, everyone, uh, almost all of you, except for the, perhaps some of the lecturers, are young in your 20s or uh, maybe early 30s, um, I'd like to tell you about uh, uh, something that many of us are very excited about, which are the plans what the, uh, for an accelerate pump that would be the next step beyond the LTC. Uh, and uh, the motivations for doing that um, and uh, what's going on right now to try and make it happen. Um, and I think it's particularly relevant uh, for an audience of your age, because if such a facility is built, uh, it'll be the machine for your generation, certainly not for mine. I'll be wandering around with a cane, maybe, uh, but, uh, but uh, it'll be the machine for your generation. So I think that those are the two things I'd like to talk about. Um, uh, uh, now, if you do want to see um, a more detailed uh, set of on uh, what I was originally planning on talking about, um, uh, which is a more detailed uh, uh, introduction to hadron collider physics. Um, uh, I can't be there in person. Maybe I can, uh, I can suggest the following lectures I gave uh, at, the, um, uh, at the summer school that we have at the IAS uh, all the way back in 2008, although the, uh, the, the basic sub subject matter changed, obviously. Um, you can find it online at the Institute website, uh, and it was called LHC Crash Course uh, at the uh, PITP uh, 2008. But um, the, the, the first uh, part of this uh, lecture today is going to be uh, more quickly uh, and with a little bit more, a little less detail, uh, talking about um, uh, what I covered in three, three or four hours uh, in those lectures. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Um, uh, starting with the LHC, uh, and here are some some uh, some basics about the LHC. Most of these things uh, you guys know. Um, the LHC is a proton-on collider, 
and the center of mass energy, the collision from 7 TeV uh, it went to 8 TeV, and now when it's starting back up, imminently starting with 13 TeV, the initial uh, design energy was 14 TeV. Um, it's not obvious we're going to get up to 14 TeV. We might get up to 13 and a half TeV, maybe 14 TeV eventually. So that's the first number that I'm sure you all know. Another extremely important um, uh, number is the luminosity uh, of the machine, and the instant luminosity uh, is um, a 10 to the 34 per centimeter squared per second. And uh, we're going to see in a second, why did it have to be 10 to the 34? Why didn't it have to be 10 to the 44 or 10 to the 26? What's special about the number 10 to the 34? We'll see that uh, in a second. Um, uh, almost as a definition of what luminosity is, the number of events um, uh, that get a particular process, if that process has a cross-section sigma, uh, the number of events is sigma times the luminosity. Uh, and uh, also, uh, there are some units that we tend to use for cross-sections in, uh, in a particle physics. Uh, of course, uh, since we're particle physicists, we really should do everything in natural units. Um, let me just remind you what natural units are. If you're a, uh, if you're a, uh, if you're a, if you're someone who doesn't know these unit conversions by heart, uh, go into your closet and learn them um, because the, they really need to be on the tip of your, your tongue. Okay. So the standard unit conversion is that the proton has a mass of around one GeV. Um, in fact, it's so lucky that its mass is close to a GeV. I think we should redefine GeV to be the mass of the proton, uh, so it's actively natural. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the mass of the proton is around 1 GeV. The size of the proton is around 1 over a GeV, and that size is also around 10 to the minus 14 centimeters. That's the most basic uh, uh, unit of conversion, that an inverse GeV is around 10 to the minus 14 centimeters. Um, uh, an inverse TeV, which scales that we're approaching at the LAC, is around 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. And so you start seeing why that number, 10 to the 34 per centimeter squared per second, where that came from, because uh, that 10 to the 34 is allowing, roughly speaking, TEV scale processes to happen on a human time scale of seconds. We'll see a little bit later that it's uh, a little slower than that, but, uh, um, but uh, that's, that's roughly what's going on. Now, um, the this, uh, a set of units that we introduce in talking about things in particle physics is a unit area or section called a barn. Okay? And, uh, this is, I think, a joke amongst uh, some experimentalists uh, 40 or 50 years ago. I have no idea why they decided to uh, 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 a barn. There are many stories for why they did. But anyway, a barn is defined to be around 10 to the minus 24 centimeters. Um, and uh, those Total cross-section, anything happening in proton If you send two protons together, smashing into each other, the total cross-section is around area of protons, around 10 to the minus 14 centimeters all squared. Um, a little bit that, things like that, so it's a little bit more like 10 centimeters squared. So, uh, in mind, total proton, proton cross-section. Sorry, Nima, we, we cannot hear you now. Oh, okay. Okay, now, now it's, it's okay. Now it's okay. Go ahead. Thanks. No. All right. So uh, let's now talk about some of the typical cross sections uh, to expect at the LHC. So, uh, let's say the typical strong interact process associated with strong interactions is the Hadron Collider. Um, a, a, a typical cross section will go like alpha S squared. Uh, divided by the energy, so divided by around the TeV squared. Alpha S is around 0.1, uh, and so alpha S squared over TeV squared is 10 to the minus 36 centimeters squared. So that's around a picobar, and those are the typical uh, cross-sections um, that we care about at the uh, LHC. So in the next line, uh, the sort of uh, cross-section, starting from around a millibarn, that was, remember, the size of the proton, 10 to the minus 27 centimeters squared. 
And then I don't remember what SI units are. So I, there's milli, then micro, then nano, then pico, then femto. But a pico barn is around 10 to the minus 36 centimeters squared. A barn is around 10 to the minus 39 centimeters squared. And those are the typical LCC cross sections that we are talking about. Now, uh, let's um, uh, get a little bit more detail about what various processes uh, are. Again, the total section is around the miller barn. That's around 10 to the 9. And so that gives you an idea of what the 10 to the 34 per centimeter squared uh, luminosity is, uh, uh, instantaneous luminosity is defined for you. There's a, there's a billion events a second. Um, now, let's talk about some other processes in the standard model. For example, the production of top quarks. Uh, uh, the cross-section for T bar production is around 1,000 peak barns, so that's around 10 events every second. Now, think about what a huge leap that is, because uh, the top quark, after all, was discovered at Fermilab in the mid-1990s. Uh, Fermilab was colliding things at around uh, 2 TeV center of mass energy. Um, and when the top quark was first discovered, it was discovered with a handful of events, 14, 15 events, okay? So that was the big triumph of the mid-1990s. Now we're gonna uh, produce 10 of them per second. Uh, so that's uh, part of the uh, experimentalist maxim that uh, yesterday, discovery today's exploration is tomorrow's background. Um, so, uh, so these are enormous rates for ordinary metabolic um, the production of a single point boson. So if you have an up quark and an anti down quark coming together uh, from the boson, it can produce a W. Single W production or single Z production is around uh, the part, about to event the thing. Um, pair production of Ws and Zs is 100 to the bar. Um, that's uh, one uh, uh, event a second. And the uh, production of, if, 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 if we're supporting uh, partners that are around the TEV scale, and we'll see college superpartners on the TV scale, that's just what we talked about. It's a typical process section of about a pico barn, and that's about one event per minute. So that's the time scale to produce one of these uh, uh, minute if 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 uh, if we're working. Um, but you also see the background you have to beat down in order to be able to pick those uh, very rare uh, events out uh, compared to the uh, much more Sorry, Nima, again, we're not hearing you. Is this better now? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. So uh, why is it that we have a prayer of picking out these ordinary processes, um, or these rare processes over the ordinary ones? Um, uh, the most basic thing is that, is that total cross-section of a milk bar. And then just completely breaking apart into other uh, strongly interacting hadrons that go roughly back to back in the direction that the beam came from to begin with. Uh, so we're instead interested in the events where the where the point light part inside the proton hits their head. At a large angle relative to the beam. So that's one of the basic but that's also true for the pro, uh, for the production of the top quarks and the Ws and so on. Many for is for beating down backgrounds. This is a, a big job of but rough. Of your things. Sorry, Nima. Again, there is a problem. It seems. Uh, I'll maybe speak a little more slowly. Uh, uh, for instance, if uh, you produce super parts that weigh EV, we'll try to call them by phone. Uh, okay. Uh, for a, uh, if the boys have six, the phone, the standard model. Uh, so should we ask him to stop now? Yeah, no, just, just wait a minute. We'll call him by phone now. Uh, Nima, I think there's, uh, we are going to call you back. Just okay. hold on for a minute.
So, um, uh, one more bit of terminology. You often hear people talk about the integrated luminosity, uh, uh, which is a measure of the total amount of data which is going to be uh, gathered in a, in a particular period of time. So, the integrated luminosity of run two of the LHC, which is the one that's just about to start now, uh, is going to be around 100 inverse femtobar. Now, this is a, this is a good unit. Um, because, uh, because it allows you to immediately figure out how many events of a given cross-section uh, you can expect to get in that run. So if we have, if we have uh, a cross-section of a pico barn, then with 100 inverse femto barn, um, uh, we will get, uh, well, a pico barn is 1,000 femto barn. And if we have 100 inverse femto barn, then we get 100 times 1,000 or 10 to the 5 events. Um, so that, that, that gives you a measure. Uh, and you can also see uh, what we're, what we're uh, going to have uh, in the coming years with the LHC. So by the end of run two, uh, which is going to be, I think, uh, sometime uh, in 2017, we'll have correct, uh, collected around 100 inverse femtobarn of data. Uh, uh, by the end of this year, we should maybe have around 20 inverse femtobarn of data. Um, by the end of run three, which is going to be sometime in 2020, uh, we'll have 300 inverse femtobarn of data. Uh, and uh, people are talking about a uh, high luminosity upgrade of the LHC, which would get a factor of 10 more data than that, 3,000 inverse femtobarn. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's move on. Now, um, if you go to any uh, talk on the LHC, uh, let's say you're talking about uh, uh, the search for supersymmetry uh, at the LHC. Um, you'll see a plot that looks like this. Uh, and this is, this is a cartoon, but this is a typical uh, cross-sections for supersymmetric particles. Um, and, and you see that uh, on the vertical axis is the cross-section in femtobarns, uh, starting up at around 1,000 picobarn, uh, uh, to a picobarn to around a femtobarn. And typically, uh, the colored supersymmetric particles uh, have cross-sections that look like I've shown. So they range from maybe 1,000 picobarn if their light is 100 GeV. Of course, they can't be that light anymore, uh, um, very likely, given what we've learned from the LHC. But this is the sort of plots that you would have seen before the LHC turned on. Um, uh, they go all the way from 1,000 picobarn down to about a femtobarn, uh, or, or less, if you go up to around the TeV scale. And the production cross-section for uncolored particles, so things that only have electroweak quantum numbers, are around 1,000 times smaller, but they have the same qualitative shape. Okay? They all uh, uh, they, they, they go down like that. Now, if you look at a plot like this, you might be puzzled. Um, because, uh, well, first of all, it indicates the great challenge to experimentalists, because it looks like they have to be prepared for, and they continue to have to be prepared for, cross-sections that could vary by almost a factor of a million between just 100 GeV and a TeV, okay? Um, and of course, also, uh, ultimately, between the colored guys and the uncolored guys, cross-sections that can vary by as much of a factor of a billion <laughs> going from one, one uh, uh, to the other. But if you look at a plot like this, <clears throat> uh, you might wonder why there is such a humongous difference between uh, producing particles that weigh 100 GeV and a TeV. <clears throat> After all, if you think about your elementary quantum field theory courses, you know that uh, all the couplings that we talk about, either in the standard model or you know, in supersymmetry or whatever, um, all the coupling constants are dimensionless. They're reasonably large. You know, so alpha S for color is around 0.1. Um, uh, and everything else you think is given just by dimensional analysis. So the cross-section, as we just estimated before, the cross-section goes like alpha s squared over the energy squared, over the center of mass energy squared. So you might have expected to see a variation by about a factor of 100 in these plots. But instead, we see a variation by a factor of about a million in these plots. So what is the difference? What is the difference? Um, uh, why are we getting a factor of a million and not just a factor of 100? Um, <clears throat> if I go to the next slide, so uh, here you don't have to look at these things in any detail, um, but just so you see that it's more than a cartoon, um, 
uh, the next slide shows so characteristic cross sections for the LHC at 7 TeV. Okay, so this is the, the run that was just uh, uh, completed. Seven, I think this was seven and not eight, but anyway. Um, and just so you see, it looks exactly like what I was showing you before. Okay, uh, uh, but, and you see this uh, huge variation of a factor of a million in the production of gluino pairs at the top, squark pairs at the top, uh, all the way down to uh, sleptons uh, at the bottom. Um, uh, if you look at the scale on the graphs, of course, you see the, the, the big difference between colored particles and uncolored particles, but you also see this characteristic very fast drop uh, as a function of, uh, of for the cross section as a, as a function of the mass. So that was a picture at, uh, at 7 TeV. <clears throat> um, here's a picture at 14 TeV. Um, anyway, you see exactly, exactly the same thing. Um, so, all right, so, so that's one thing that you could be, uh, uh, that's one qualitative thing you need to understand. Um, now, something else that you might naively uh, wonder is this. Um, everyone seems to be very excited about the next run of the LHC turning on, but why are they so excited? I mean, um, after all, we just had a run at 8 TeV, and now we're going up to 13 TeV. 13 doesn't seem that much bigger than 8. So why is it going to be such a big deal going up um, uh, from, from 8 to 13? Um, if you think along those lines, uh, you, might, um, uh, you might actually extrapolate a little bit more. Uh, why were people so excited in going from the Tevatron to the LHC? Uh, the Tevatron had a center mass energy at 2 TeV. Um, the first run of the LHC was at 7 TeV. So that's just a factor of 3.5. Why the hell were people so excited? Just about a stupid factor of 3.5. Um, uh, these two questions, why the cross-section uh, in the previous plots varied by a factor of a million, and why these modest seeming gains in energy uh, are people are so excited about, uh, they both have a common answer. Um, and, uh, and we can see it uh, in, in this slide. Uh, the reason is that there is a crucial qualitative fact about um, collisions at Hadron Colliders. Um, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, you all know. You all know about the famous Parton model. Um, you know that uh, uh, it's not true that we should think of the proton as just being made out of an up quark and, and two down quarks. Um, um, or sorry, two up quarks and a down quark. Even worse. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but, um, uh, but it's not that they have those two, uh, that they have these constituents that are, um, uh, three constituents that are banging into each other. Um, uh, in, we, we should instead think of them as a big messy bag of uh, those uh, valence quarks, the two up quarks and the down quark, but they radiate. They radiate the gluons and the gluons can further split into quarks and antiquarks and these splitting processes can continue more and more and more. Um, and so, uh, so, so in fact, uh, depending on the uh, depending on the the energy scale uh, with which we're taking a snapshot of this collision, uh, we can either see the proton as being made out of a few partons or more and more and more partons. Uh, and if the uh, and uh, in fact, it's more and more likely to see the energy of the proton shared with more and more partons as you go down to lower and lower energies, um, uh, uh, center of mass energies for the collisions of the apartheid. Um And that means that if I think of the cross-section, um, if I think of the cross-section uh, uh, for some processes that's initiated by two partons, A and B, banging into each other, um, there is the naive uh, pro uh, scaling that we talked about before, something that just goes like 1 over the center of mass energy squared, 1 over s, so some dimensionless amplitude over s, that, that's the usual naive factor. But then there is a very important factor that tells you how likely it is to find partons carrying, uh, those, uh, carrying the energies for those collisions. Okay? Um, uh, that factor ultimately comes from the parton distribution functions, uh, and uh, here it's uh, subsumed in, in something that's called the parton luminosity. Okay? So that, that, that gives you a measure, as I said, of how likely it is to find um, uh, the partons inside the proton carrying that fraction of the uh, energy. 
Uh, the, uh, the details of how to think about this in the Parton model and so on, that's one of the things that uh, is discussed in those old lectures uh, that I mentioned. Um, but uh, for now, you'll just have to um, take it for, uh, uh, on faith that uh, uh, we can measure these parton luminosities um, experimentally. We can measure them, for example, uh, ultimately we can measure the, uh, the parton distribution functions from other experiments like deep and elastic scattering and, and, uh, and, and other places, and then uh, use them for hadron-hadron collisions. And the very important point is that these parton luminosities are very rapidly falling functions of S, the very rapidly falling functions of energy. So you can see that on this slide. <clears throat> um, also on the, on the uh, 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 what, 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 what's plotted is the, uh, is the parton luminosities for different um, pairs of initial states for the, proton, uh, for the uh, parton. So, so there's, for instance, quark-quark, um, or quark-antiquark. Uh, the quark-quark is in blue, quark-antiquark in red, quark-gluon in green, and glue-glue in, uh, in the yellow. So this shows you how much this sort of naive picture that the proton is made out of two up quarks and a down quark. Okay? Uh, in that naive picture of the proton is made out of two up quarks and a down quark, you would think that the only, uh, uh, the only parton luminosity uh, would be of two quarks banging into each other. And so you see that that's, that's sort of roughly true. This quark quark parton distribution function, uh, which is a guy in blue, is the biggest one when you go to su ultimately sufficiently high center of mass energies for the collision, up to, you know, uh, at a, at bigger than around two and a half keV or so, uh, the quark quark luminosity is the biggest. But already, as you go to lower energies, and, uh, and those lower energies are the ones really relevant for the, uh, for the production of most of the things that we're talking about, um, uh, the quark gluon becomes the biggest one, okay? Um, so, so uh, and if you go to even somewhat lower energy still, you, you don't quite see it on this plot, but some, somewhere around 500 GeV, uh, um, uh, or a little lower, it's actually gluon gluons, uh, which have the biggest uh, luminosity. Okay, so, um, so you should really think of the LHC as a gluon gluon or a gluon quark collider more than as a quark quark collider. Um, of course, there are some qualitative things that, that are roughly correct. You see that the quark anti quark uh, parton luminosity is maybe about a factor of 10 smaller than the other ones. And so that does reflect that it's a proton proton machine and not a proton anti proton machine. Uh, but still, they're not all that different from uh, each other. And that's uh, um, uh, so A, this is just crucially reflecting this basic and deep fact that we should. Uh, that what the proton looks like is dependent on the, the energy with which uh, uh, we uh, probe it. And B, you see how rapidly falling these things are. Notice that the vertical scale is logarithmic, okay? Um, now, because of that, so if we go back, uh, this factor rho AB as a function of S is very rapidly falling. Uh, and so this has, uh, this has a very important consequence, um, two very important consequences. One is that any particle at the LHC, any massive particle, is produced roughly near threshold, okay? Now, uh, again, this is, this is completely not what you'd expect. If we're colliding electrons and positrons, if we're colliding electrons and positrons at one TeV and we're producing top quarks, uh, which weigh you know, 175 GeV, then the top quarks would be coming out with humongous energy, okay? They'd be coming out very boosted. Um, uh, this is not true at the LHC. Um, every, or, or at any hadron collider, uh, massive particles are typically produced at threshold. And they're produced at threshold because uh, the, this falling parton luminosity is such a heavy price to pay um, that, uh, that, uh, that, that the production is dominated by uh, taking place at the lowest possible energy that it can. Um, okay? so. Um, now, secondly, uh, by staring at these parton distributions, there's a rough rule of thumb, um, and uh, so, so as you see, it, uh, the, the parton luminosities depend, you know, they have some detailed shape that's different for the different uh, underlying partons, so this formula is a rough figure of thumb, um, but if you naively thought that the cross-section goes like 1 over mass squared, um, then the, the correction from the falling parton luminosities 
goes roughly like the center of mass energy divided by the mass of the particle to the fourth. The center of mass energy of the collision you're talking about divided by the mass of the particle to the fourth. Okay? Um, uh, that, that four, you know, it's, it's, it's a number that can go from like 3.3 to 4 or something. So that's, a, again, just a rough rule of thumb. But you see that the cross-section goes like uh, then roughly the center of mass energy to the fourth, fourth over the mass to the sixth. This formula explains uh, all the qualitative things we saw in our previous plot. First, it explains why it is that the cross-sections vary by a factor of a million. Because uh, when we vary uh, the mass by a factor of 10, again, there's this extra 1 over m to the fourth compared to what we expected before. And it secondly tells you why people are so excited, even with factors of only two increase in the uh, center of mass energy of the machine, because at a fixed mass, the rate for producing the new particles scales like a pretty high power of the center of mass energy. It scales like about the center of mass energy to the fourth. So not only is it true when you go to higher energies that, of course, you have access for producing heavier particles. That's obvious. But also, the rate for producing particles at a fixed mass scales like this high power of the center of mass energy of the machine. And so we can get a more quantitative estimate for how much more exciting run two of the LHC is relative to run one. So run two, first, it's going to have 100 inverse femtobarn to barn of data versus around 20 inverse femtobarn to barn that was gathered in run one. So there's just a factor of five in the amount of overall data. But also we win by this a factor of the ratio of the energies 13 TeV to 8 TeV, roughly to the fourth power. And actually, we win a little bit more than that. So uh, by the time you have uh, put it all in, run two, what's going to be completed in the next couple of years, is going to be, roughly speaking, 100 times more powerful than run one. It's going to gather you know, roughly uh, 100 times more of the same data uh, than, uh, than uh, we could have gotten in run one, in addition to having access to slightly, slightly uh, uh, somewhat heavier particles, okay? So just to uh, calibrate that again, in the first month of running, in the first month of running in run two, um, uh, only one inverse femto barn uh, gathered or so, um, uh, the effective data set uh, that we'll have will double relative to what we had uh, from run one, okay? So, um, so uh, there's two broad lessons then that you can take away from, uh, from what I told you about the LHC. Um, uh, so these, if, if you remember nothing else from uh, this, this, this part of the lecture, uh, this is, uh, this is what, what you should remember. So first, the LHC is fantastic at producing colored particles. It's obvious, it's colliding protons. Um, and the reach for colored particles goes from about one to three TeV. Okay? Um, the reach for uncolored particles, just electroweak uh, particles, is uh, about a factor of you know uh, uh, five, six, uh, smaller than that, uh, and goes from maybe 200 to four or 500 GeV. Okay, so the LHC is really powerful at producing colored particles, um, uh, and the reach for electroweak particles is roughly an order of magnitude smaller than that. Okay, so that's one thing. And secondly, you should remember this rough scaling uh, of the cross-section going like center of mass uh, energy to the fourth over mass to the sixth. Um, this is a general factor of life at Hadron Colliders. And it tells you that by far the biggest gain that you get is with increasing energy uh, versus gathering more data at a fixed energy. Okay? Um, so, uh, and that's why every time there is an energy upgrade, the biggest excitement, the biggest bang for the buck comes right away. Okay? Um, um, uh, because you, you win by that fourth power. Uh, after that, you're just accumulating more and more data. So you're sort of, your, your, your game is linear um, in, uh, uh, in the amount of, uh, in the amount of uh, uh, data that you gather, but you get this fourth power uh, when, whenever you make these jumps in energy. And this is why this period from 2015 to, to 2017 uh, in run two will be by far the most exciting period of the LHC running. Um, because we get this uh, uh, energy gain relative to uh, run one. All right, so now I apologize, this is a slightly busy slide, but I just wanted to illustrate uh, uh, some of these points just so you have an idea for what we might know when, okay? So let's say uh, we're interested in 
um, uh, producing super partners at the LHC. So we're interested in the Gluino, okay? Um, right now, there's a limit from the LHC, depending on precisely how the Gluino decays and so on. Uh, say in, 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 uh, it, uh, in over a broad range of parameter space, the Gluino has been excluded at around the two sigma level up to around 1.5 TeV. So in other words, the Gluino could be at 1.4 or 1.5 TeV, and we would not have known it uh, so far from run two. Um, if the Gluino decays in a slightly more exotic way, or things are a little bit uh, slightly different, maybe it's been only excluded down to a TeV. So, so the, the, the red curves we're going to be talking about uh, correspond to the case where uh, the Gluino is, uh, um, uh, um, uh, well, let, 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 let's only focus on the red curve, okay? So uh, I don't want to, uh, just a, yeah, let's just focus on the, uh, uh, on, 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 on the red curve. All right, so, so, so let's say that the Gluino is really sitting there at 1.5 TeV. It's been excluded at two sigma, let's say at 1.5 TeV by run one. What this is now showing you, what the red line is, is what the two sigma exclusion will be uh, at 13 TeV at the LHC as a function of the uh, integrated, total integrated luminosity in inverse Hampton bar, okay? So you see that right away, uh, right away, I mean, we can't even see it, um, uh, right, uh, uh, right where the red curve starts, um, so basically with an inverse Hampton bar or even a little less of data, run two will already uh, repeat what we learned at, at run one and will and will exclude a 1.5 uh, 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 TeV, 1.4 TeV Gluino. Now, let's say that we continue not to see the Gluino, okay? Let's say that, uh, that, uh, uh, that still nothing is seen by the end of this year. So the end of this year, um, uh, we, we, we see that, uh, so here is uh, 2015. Uh, the end of uh, this year, around 20 inverse femta barn of data, if we don't see anything, we'll put, uh, we'll be able to exclude the Gluino up to around 2 TeV, okay? Um, now, let's say that we continue not to see it. Uh, I'll come back to the optimistic scenario in a second, but let's say that we, we go all the way to the end of run two with 100 inverse, uh, with 100 inverse from the barn. Um, what, will, what will we have uh, uh, done by then? Well, we'll exclude going up here, around the 2.4 TeV Gluino, okay? Now, let's say that we still see nothing up to 2020 um, in the end of run three. Then we're up here, we exclude a 2.5 TeV Gluino, and asymptotically, we'll get maybe, uh, you know, a few thousand inverse femtor barn uh, uh, with the high luminosity LHC run, so this is infinite time on this axis, okay? Um, but you see that even the, uh, you know, even going all the way up, we'll get up to maybe a 3 TeV Gluino, right? Uh, excluding a, a 3 TeV Gluino. So, um, so uh, again, that, 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 that shows you uh, what, how powerful uh, the gain in energy is relative to just accumulating more data. Um, as I said, uh, if the Gluino's uh, uh, if the Gluino is right around at one and a half TeV, we, we'll repeat that exclusion in the first month of running. But over the entire future period of the LHC, uh, we'll cover the range from one and a half TeV to three TeV for the Gluino. Okay. Now, the converse of uh, uh, everything I was saying, and all of these plots, all of these things are just reflecting that basic physics that I was telling you about before. Okay. Uh, the center of mass energy to the fourth, one over mass to the sixth, um, all of that stuff. Um, now, let's say conversely, let's say the Gluino really was at 1.4 TeV. We just barely missed it at, at the first one of the LHC, okay? So a two sigma exclusion, um, this is another rough figure of merit, okay? A, a rough rule of thumb that, uh, that the number of events that you need to exclude something at five sigma, sorry, to discover something at five sigma is roughly 10 times bigger uh, than what you need to exclude it at two sigma, uh, to not see it at two sigma. So, uh, so that means that uh, that that uh, if the Gluino is really at one and a half TeV, then 
it wasn't seen at run one, and it was excluded at two sigma, let's say 1.4 TeV was excluded at two sigma in run one, but the, something that was excluded uh, or right at the limit from run one could be discovered at five sigma by the end of this year. Okay? So that, that, that again shows you the power of the leap in, uh, in uh, energy. Um, uh, and so on the, uh, on the vertical axis here in purple, I've, I've indicated uh, what the discoveries uh, could be. So, uh, so, um, so, uh, uh, sorry, in, in, in blue, I've indicated what the discoveries could be. So, so one and a half TeV gluino could be discovered at five sigma by the end of, uh, of this year. It could be discovered up to around 1.8, 1.7, 1.8 TeV by 2017. Uh, it could be discovered up to 2.1 TeV by 2020. And, um, and of course, we could be a little lucky. Uh, th this is, uh, this, this is a, a little conservative, um, what I've indicated here, but still, it's, it's roughly correct. It can be discovered uh, up to around 2.5 TeV um, uh, in the super-duper asymptotic future of the uh, LHC. Okay? Um, <clears throat> but you, we also see some other, uh, we also see some other uh, interesting things. That, so let's say it's the end of run two. If it's, the end of, if it's the end of run two, and we've only excluded gluinos, if we've only excluded them, um, then, uh, then uh, so we, 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 we've excluded them up to here, okay? Uh, then uh, we're not going to discover them. We're not going to discover them um, uh, until perhaps we get to the high luminosity run of the uh, LHC, okay? So all of this is just to uh, repeat uh, in a little more quali uh, quantitative uh, detail, uh, the same mantra over and over. The biggest uh, gain is with going to higher energies at the very beginning. After that, it's more painful, gradual uh, increase with extra luminosity. Um, and, uh, and the five sigma discovery, uh, there should be harbingers with lower sigma uh, hints and indications. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, this is why the, this coming year is uh, year or two is by far the most exciting period, and then after that, um, uh, of course, it's still possible that we'll make the uh, discoveries, but it, it'll, it but uh, it gets uh, it gets more and more difficult. Okay, so um, uh, by the way, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So, all right. So. Um, so that was all I want to say about the LHC, and now I wanted to turn to the second topic. And since I've spent uh, quite a bit of time on the LHC, don't worry, I won't make you sit through the following uh, 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 49 uh, transparencies in a detail, but I want to tell you a little bit about it. Um, so, <clears throat> so this is the, it's the next uh, 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 step after the LHC. Um, these machines take you know, 25, 30 years to uh, think of, conceive, um, design, plan, and build. Uh, and so uh, a lot of people around the world um, have been thinking about what the next step uh, after the LHC will be. Of course, for a long time, um, and it remains a very, uh, a very good, exciting, important possibility, uh, is to consider electron-positron collisions at a linear collider. And Japan is thinking about building a linear collider, and that's that's uh, that's that's very very important. Um, uh, uh, but ultimately, if we want to get to the energy frontier again, we ultimately want to get to a uh, uh, in, to another big circular collider that can uh, that can collide protons at let's say around 100 TeV. Um, and so that's what people are uh, starting to talk about now: are great big circular colliders. Um, uh, the, the circumference, uh, the circumference of the LHC is around 27 kilometers. Uh, the circumference, the, the circumference that people are talking about here would be around 100 kilometers, uh, and you could you could collide. Um, uh, one thing that you could do, very much like the uh, uh, program at CERN, is you could actually start colliding electrons and positrons in this uh, uh, in this uh, tunnel uh, at a center mass energy of around 250 GeV. Uh, and you could do that to produce uh, millions of Higgs particles and study the properties of the Higgs in great detail. Um, uh, and then you could uh, go to, eventually, uh, in the same tunnel, to collide uh, protons uh, uh, at an energy of about 800 TeV or so. Okay, so just so you have some idea of, of, of the uh, numbers, 
Um, right now, the LHC, like I said, it's 27 kilometers, uh, and uh, the central driver, uh, the main driver um, uh, of uh, the size and cost and all of these things of, uh, of, uh, of these machines, especially for hadron colliders, are the magnets that you need to bend the protons around. Okay? Now, at the LHC, they have uh, magnets that have around 8 tesla of strength. So, if you go and you build a 100 kilometer tunnel, uh, and you take the magnets we have from the LHC right now, we shove them in the 100 kilometer tunnel, uh, then you will have yourself a collider that's a little more than 50 TeV. Okay? So, if you really want to get to 100 TeV, uh, then um, you need to make the magnets stronger. Now, fortunately, the people who spend their lives developing these uh, super-duper uh, high-field uh, superconducting magnets, um, they have it on their agenda uh, to make these much higher field magnets. Actually, right now, um, uh, 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 in uh, America, at, at Fermilab and at, uh, uh, at, at LBL, uh, people have magnets that are around 11 and a half uh, Tesla working already. And this community of people believes that on the 10 or 15 year time scale, they can get uh, 15 Tesla magnets. Um, in fact, they even talk about eventually, with the more ambitious technology, getting 20 Tesla magnets. So, so going from 8 to 15 seems, uh, seems like a conservative bet, um, uh, that on the 10 or 15 year time scale, the 15 Tesla magnets will be available. And if you put those 15 Tesla magnets into a 100 kilometer tunnel, you, you get yourself a 100 TeV proton proton collider. Uh, but those magnets aren't going to be ready tomorrow or even probably 10 years from now. And that's another motivation for just starting to build uh, a 100 kilometer uh, tunnel somewhere, starting to dig. Um, and uh, when you have it, to first run the C plus C minus program because uh, you can study everything about uh, lots and lots of important things about, about the Higgs while you're waiting for the magnets to be developed and to come up to the point uh, where you can then, um, in the same tunnel, uh, use them to do proton-proton collisions. So that's the, that's the thing which is being talked about. And this is being very seriously talked about uh, at CERN, uh, where this program is called, uh, goes under the general rubric of the FCC for Future Circular Colliders. Um, there's actually just a, a, a little earlier, uh, even uh, 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 this week, there was a big meeting in Washington where they were talking about uh, their, their plans for doing this. Uh, and it's also being seriously discussed uh, in China um, where the project goes under the name of a CEPC for Circular Electron-Positron Collider for the uh, E plus E minus option and SPPC for Super Proton-Proton Collider uh, for, the, uh, for the 100 TeV option. Um, and so, uh, so th this, is, uh, uh, this is really something which is, which is being taken uh, quite seriously by the, uh, by the international uh, particle physics community now. There's a lot of uh, excitement about it for obvious reasons. It's the, um, uh, I think a, a facility like this would be the, uh, the 30, 40 year future um, uh, of, of the experimental part of our field would be uh, uh, very important. So I just want to tell you a little bit um, in the time I have left, a little bit about uh, some of the motivations um, for uh, doing this. And uh, the tack that I want to take here, um, obviously, if in this coming run of the LHC, we discover some new particles, uh, let's say we discover you know, these one and a half TeV, 1.6 TeV gluinos, uh, then it's completely obvious that we're going to uh, want to keep going and study them and so on. And I'll say a little bit more um, uh, uh, about that. But, uh, but essentially, independent of what the LHC does or doesn't find, um, we have a need to continue. Um, and, uh, and it's not just for, it's not just because we should keep going, explore, et cetera, all that's true. Um, but uh, it's for more, more specific reasons. We already know, um, given that we've seen the Higgs at the LHC, and given that we haven't seen anything else yet, uh, we already know, no matter what the LHC sees, um, that there are questions that we're not going to get, important questions we're not gonna get the answers from, from the LHC, and so we're absolutely going to have to keep going and these two facilities are actually complementary uh, um, uh, to each other for doing that. Um, but let me just say uh, that um, uh, in, in, in having the rest of this uh, discussion, I'm going to focus on the possibility um, that, in fact, the LHC won't see anything other than the Higgs. Okay? 
Okay, we'll see nothing, uh, we'll just see the Higgs and nothing else. Um, and this is a case that, that many people uh, in our field for a long time have been, I, I think, very stupidly calling the nightmare scenario um, and saying, oh, it would be so terrible if we don't see new particles other than the Higgs, uh, uh, oh, the field is over, and, you know, uh, why should we keep going experimentally? We'll never convince politicians to build another machine, blah, blah, blah. There, there, there's, a, there's, there's some subset of people who've said words like that for many years. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's really quite, quite silly, uh, and I just want to spend a few minutes uh, 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 talking about that, uh, that the attitude, um, because uh, this comes from a basic attitude that thinks that, that new physics is equated with new particles. Um, and uh, it's true, it's true that in the period of uh, great discovery in particle physics, um, uh, from the, from the 60s, the sort of last era that a lot of people uh, think back to as the, as the glorious period of the subject, that there, there were many new particles that were discovered, and the new particles told us uh, a lot about, uh, about the structure of fundamental physics leading to the standard model. Um, but, uh, uh, but, new but new physics has not always meant new particles, and in fact, the biggest conceptual changes that we've been driven to in fundamental physics you know, the, the, the standard model is not one of those things. The standard model is a spectacular accomplishment, but it took place completely within the rubric of a structure, uh, of, the, of the revolutionary structure that was handed down from the first part of the 20th century, relativity and quantum mechanics. Those were the really big, humongous revolutionary uh, developments. The standard model is, relatively speaking, a detail compared to that. Um, and, uh, and the really big revolutions were not associated necessarily with the discovery of new particles. Um, so new physics does not always mean new particles. Uh, what new physics really means, what we really care about, are new phenomena. And we care about the new phenomenon because uh, they're associated with new principles. Um, uh, that's what we really care about. If it happens that those new phenomena and new principles come in the form of lots of new particles, wonderful. Uh, but they have not always come in that form. Um, just to give you an example of an uh, extremely important null result of not seeing a particle or, or anything having a, uh, being hugely significant, um, the fact that uh, people looked for a drift through the ether and they didn't see it, uh, that wasn't looking for particles, it was looking for a phenomenon and they didn't even see it. But not seeing it was an enormous deal. Uh, knowing that, that, that there isn't an, an ether was, uh, was one of the uh, most profound things that we could have discovered experimentally. Uh, about uh, the way the world worked a uh, hundred years ago. So um, now, uh, because of uh, uh, so so with this uh, with this attitude, uh, I think that uh, in fact the Higgs itself is really new physics. Um, uh, not because it's a particle that we didn't expect or didn't think about uh, beforehand. We did. Uh, but in fact, it's an extremely unusual particle. We've never seen anything like the Higgs before. We've never seen an elementary spin zero particle. Um, um, and um, uh, that's, that's what we've seen with the Higgs. In fact, there are very good theoretical arguments that we shouldn't have seen uh, uh, point-like spin zero particles. Uh, the arguments revolving around fine-tuning and the hierarchy problem. There are analogs of this argument in condensed matter physics. Um, uh, uh, that, that work and explain uh, why it is that we don't see uh, anything that looks like the Higgs in, uh, in, in ordinary, in the long distance effective field theory of ordinary materials. Uh, we can engineer all kinds of quantum field theories in the lab. Our condensed matter friends can engineer all kinds of exciting and interesting quantum field theories in the lab. They can have things that look like gauge fields. They can have things that look like fermions and chiral fermions but they never have anything that looks like the Higgs. Um, they don't have these elementary, uh, what look like point-like spin zero particles um, uh, in uh, ordinary, you know, zero temperature uh, um, uh, uh, materials. Uh, and there is a good reason for it. Uh, there's a good reason for it that, that Ken Wilson figured out that, that, that it's unnatural for uh, scalars to be like. Um, uh, you have to finally adjust the properties of the material in order to get a very light scalar. And unless there's someone doing that fine adjustment, um, uh, we don't expect to see light scalars. Whereas the existence of fermions and gauge fields um, 
is, uh, uh, can be natural. The ultimate reason for this, uh, the ultimate reason why there is fine tuning associated with making uh, scalars light, but there isn't fine tuning associated with making um, uh, photons or uh, spin, uh, spin one particles or spin half particles light, is that there's a discontinuous difference between the number of degrees of freedom for particles with spin. If I take a, uh, if I take a photon, the, uh, uh, sorry, between masses and massive particles. If I take a photon, uh, the massless photon has two degrees of freedom. The massive photon, a massive spin one particle has three degrees of freedom. And that's why you can't, just little interactions can't tr make a massless uh, spin one particle into a massive spin one particle because you can't change the number of degrees of freedom discontinuously. Uh, exactly the same thing is true for everything else, for chiral fermions. Um, but spin zero particles is different because there's no difference in degrees of freedom between uh, spin zero particles uh, of, of for spin zero particles between masses and masses. So that's what's so strange uh, uh, about, uh, about the Higgs. Uh, in many ways, it's the simplest possible particle we could have discovered. Uh, it has, uh, uh, it spins zero, it has no charge. All it has is mass, but that very simplicity is what makes it so strange and what, uh, uh, and what makes it, uh, uh, and is why we've never seen it anywhere else in physics before. Uh, and uh, certainly not just in my view, in the, in the view of many of us, understanding why we got this Higgs to begin with is a harbinger of, of really profound new principles uh, at work in, uh, in, in the quantum vacuum. Um, uh, we, there's this basic logic of effective quantum field theory uh, that, uh, that w that's been so spectacularly successful, not just in the standard model, but everywhere else in, in the physics of uh, many body systems. Um, uh, this is a logic that would have led us to believe that we can't just see a lonely Higgs. It should come along with lots and lots of extra particles, super partners, or we should see that the Higgs is composite or has some uh, structure. Um, so either we'll see that, which is wonderful, or we won't, and then we'll know that there's, there's something wrong in, this, in the calculus of the argument uh, that, um, that we've been using that's been uh, very successful everywhere else. So, uh, so in that sense, uh, um, uh, the Higgs is actually is by itself new physics. Uh, it's new in the sense that we've never seen anything like it before, and we have to study it uh, very closely. Um, so let me um, uh, uh, just then tell you, at least in this lens, uh, uh, through this lens, what um, uh, what a uh, e plus e minus Higgs factory and a 100 TeV collider would do. And what it would do uh, just about uh, telling us more about uh, uh, about the properties of the Higgs. So first, um, uh, as I mentioned, we've never seen a point-like scalar before. It looks like, uh, roughly speaking, the Higgs, everything we've seen so far is just consistent with it being, uh, being point-like. But the LHC won't, will only give us a fairly fuzzy picture of, of the Higgs. So, um, uh, it, uh, so and, and what I've drawn here is not, is, is, a, is, a, is a cartoon. So, uh, uh, so, What I've shown is the size of the, uh, the Compton wavelength of the Higgs. There is one over the mass of the Higgs. And if the Higgs was a completely composite object, then, uh, then there would be form factors in its couplings to ordinary particles. Um, and we would already know that, uh, we'd all, we, we, we would already know that. Just like we knew from the fact that the uh, G factor for the proton is quite different than two, that the proton had a structure on a scale comparable to its mass. Um, if the Higgs had a, a substructure on a scale comparable of its mass, we would have known that already from the LHC. Its couplings to Zs and to uh, other particles would be order one different. It's not order one different. Um, but uh, but uh, through the entire running of the LHC, we're only going to measure many of these couplings to so the 10 or 15 percent level. Um, and so we're not really going to get a picture that it's particularly pointless. Uh, if you really want to see that it's point-like, you, you want to see that it has point-like couplings to all the uh, standard model particles. Uh, uh, for that, you need to build the Higgs factor. Um, and uh, uh, and the, the point here isn't so much that the number of Higgses that you produce. Uh, the LHC will produce tens of millions of Higgs particles. Um, uh, uh, but the problem is that it's producing them in a messy uh, environment of a hadron collider. And it's hard to make precision measurements um, in that way. 
Uh, however, at an E plus E minus machine, you can also produce millions of Higgs particles, but study its properties uh, in great detail in a very clean environment. And so this is the picture that we will come to. So between a kind of fuzzy picture, uh, uh, the resolution will improve by uh, 10 to 50 to in some cases 100 times better um, than the, uh, the uh, LHC. Okay. So that's, uh, that's the purpose of, of building an E plus E minus um, uh, Higgs factory. And by the way, some of this physics will also be done by the linear collider, uh, which will also be good at measuring uh, these uh, Higgs couplings. Uh, for the particular coupling that I'm drawing here, the coupling of the Higgs disease, uh, the linear collider is not quite as good as the circular E plus E minus machine, just for detailed differences, that it's uh, hard to get the luminosity um, uh, to the same level at, uh, uh, for these collisions at a, at a uh, linear collider. But still, this is basically uh, a part of the uh, physics program also for uh, the linear collider. And um, now, another crucial feature of uh, an elementary spin zero particle uh, is that um, an, uh, an elementary spin zero particle uh, can do something that we've never seen another elementary particle do, which is it can interact with itself. Um, uh, we've actually never seen self-interaction uh, self between a single elementary particle before. Um, you might think, oh, but come on, gluons self-interact with each other. We have the non-abelian self-interactions. Yes, that's true, but it's never one particle with itself. They're always changing color. Okay? Um, or you might think, well, but we know that gravitons have a self-interaction. We know that this nonlinear self-interaction between the gravitons is, uh, is uh, very important. Um, uh, yes, it's true, but it's not, uh, but there, there's a change in helicity. So we've actually never seen the most basic process you might think of in quantum field theory, which is just a self-interaction of three things with each other. We've never seen it before. Um, and the Higgs is the first particle which gives us an opportunity to see that most basic process uh, of all. Um, so in order to see even whether there is a self-interaction of the Higgs, we won't do that at the LHC. The LHC won't even tell us if this process exists. Um, but if you go to a 100 TV collider, uh, you can produce so many Higgses uh, that you can actually not only see this thing, but measure it even at the 5% level. Okay. So that's the, uh, uh, so that's, that's part of uh, the, the physics motivations and purpose of these, of these, uh, of these machines. Um, and that's a kind of the, the, the physics that's guaranteed to be studied and understood is to put the Higgs under this mic microscope, see if it looks elementary, and see if, um, uh, see if it has its uh, own uh, self-interactions. Of course, on top of that, uh, we're going to measure, uh, especially when going to the 100 TeV collider, um, uh, we're really going into uh, another big leap in energy, a factor of seven. Um, from what I told you in the previous part of the talk, uh, you see why those factors of seven are a humongous deal, right? Because now the cross-sections are going up by factors of of thousands or tens of thousands, the mass reach is going up by about a factor of five or six relative to the LHC. So it's a huge gain, both in overall reach and in uh, and in and in overall rate. And so we go into totally new territory and look for uh, for physics that uh, that that might be there, physics uh, that we just may have missed at the LHC, um, uh, and uh, also. Uh, even if there is physics that, that we see at the LHC. So let's go back to that example of the um, one and a half TeV Gluino. Uh, so let's say that the Gluino is really sitting there at one and a half TeV. We'll even discover it this year. Yay, fantastic. But that means that in the entire course of running of the LHC, we'll maybe make a few thousand of them, okay? So that's actually not enough. That's plenty enough to know. That's plenty enough to know that you've seen a new particle. No problem. Um, but it's not enough to know that it's a gluino. Uh, um, it could just be some color adjoint. Uh, you won't know that its couplings are consistent with those of a gluino. Um, so if you really want to learn these, uh, not just produce the particles, but learn what they are, even if we're fortunate uh, to produce them at the LHC, then it's not a question of needing higher energies to excess heavier particles, but it's a question of producing lots of them. So uh, that one and a half TeV gluino will produce a few thousand of them uh, at the uh, LHC, and we'll produce 100 million of them uh, at the 100 TeV collider. 
So it's a, just an enormous difference. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, on, uh, so in that case, it's a huge gain in rate. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, the actual reach for producing uh, the uh, particles, uh, the reach for producing gluinos at the LHC, as I told you, goes up to maybe 2 TeV, 2.5 TeV, 3 TeV. The reach for gluinos at a, uh, for the same gluinos at a 100 TeV collider will go up to 15 or 20 TeV. So there's a huge gain of about, about a factor of five or six uh, as you uh, go, um, uh, as you get this uh, big gain in uh, energy. So, uh, so there's the guaranteed physics of studying the properties of, of the Higgs, and, uh, and there's of course the sort of going into, um, into the big new frontier um, uh, just to explore it and see what is there. So, um, yeah, so uh, I think I'm not, going to, um, I'm not going to have time to go through uh, these things in more detail. Um, uh, maybe I can just make one point. So I'm, I'm just going to pick and choose from a few of these uh, things uh, 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 um, just, just, just to make one point um, about the importance of measuring <coughs> this uh, self-interaction of, of, of the Higgs. <coughs> there's, there's a very basic question. We discovered the Higgs, uh, so, so we know uh, what the small oscillations around the uh, so, so, so we know what breaks electroweak symmetry, the expectation value of the Higgs breaks electroweak symmetry, and so we've seen these small oscillations around the minimum uh, of, of the potential. That's the excitation, that's the Higgs. Uh, oh, actually, from the LHC, we have no idea what the global picture of the potential looks like. Okay? We don't know if it looks like the red picture, we don't know if it looks like the green picture, I mean experimentally, um, we don't know what it looks like. <clears throat> and, and, uh, and you might wonder, well, of course, the standard model tells us what it looks like. It looks like, uh, 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 the, it looks like the Landau-Ginsberg picture. It looks like M squared uh, Higgs dagger Higgs plus some quarter coupling Higgs dagger Higgs squared. Um, come on, why would, anyone picture, uh, why would anyone question that simplest possibility? Uh, sure, maybe we haven't established it experimentally, but it seems completely obvious that that simplest possibility is going to be right. Well, um, that simplest possibility that was motivated by the connection with uh, uh, condensed matter physics ultimately, uh, <clears throat> after all, came from Landau and Ginsberg thinking about the uh, phase transitions. It's exactly that same logic that leads us to think that there's a hierarchy problem. It's exactly that logic that, uh, uh, I mean, after all, why do we think this is true? Because we, we say there's physics at some, at some high energy microscopic scale, and we should just write down an effective field theory, and we should write down all the operators in the effective field theory, you know, compatible with symmetries. And so that argument is exactly the one that tells us that the mass should not be too far from the ultraviolet cutoff of the theory. Okay? So, uh, so, um, uh, so there's only a hierarchy problem to begin with, uh, or even the issue only arises uh, uh, if we actually know that the potential has this form. But suppose that we went out and we discovered experimentally that actually the potential didn't look like that. That instead of balancing a quartic uh, against uh, a quadratic instead of a quartic, maybe it was balancing a quartic against a sextic, like in this uh, second line. Or maybe the potential doesn't even, uh, isn't even well approximated by a polynomial. Maybe it has this uh, form that isn't even analytic, like, uh, uh, like Higgs to the fourth log Higgs squared. Um, this bottom form is uh, sometimes referred as the Coleman-Weinberg form for the, uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the Higgs potential. Um, if we knew for a fact that uh, this is what electroweak symmetry breaking looked like, uh, uh, it, would, it would completely change the way we, uh, we think about all the problems that we've been obsessing about for a long time. Um, uh, it would completely undercut the, uh, the Landau-Ginsberg philosophy. It would throw the hierarchy problem out the window. We'd have to, comp we'd have to well, uh, for one thing, it would give us some immediate indication that there is physics uh, talking at least to the Higgs at a scale not far away. But also, we'd, we'd wonder you know, what, what was wrong with this uh, original uh, logic uh, to begin with. <clears throat> so what I want to say is that this simplest poss possibility that comes out in the standard model, again, the very simplicity is exactly what leads us to uh, believe that we shouldn't have just seen uh, a Higgs um, alone far away from the ultraviolet cutoff of the theory. So this is not an innocuous assumption. Um, uh, and therefore, it's absolutely crucial to test it experimentally. <clears throat> so what is the leading difference between all of these possibilities? 
As far as the LHC is concerned, we will not know if it's the top or the second or the third. Um, no measurement that will be done at the LHC is going to uh, distinguish between these possibilities, and we know that right now. Um, uh, <clears throat> the reason is that the leading way that these possibilities differ is in the uh, strength of the self-interaction of the heats. And that's because when you uh, expand the potential around the minimum, uh, and you look at what the cubic self-interaction is, of course, it's going to depend on, on, uh, on the precise shape of the potential. <clears throat> and they can be order one different from each other. So, for instance, in the second case, uh, the strength of the triple Higgs coupling is seven-thirds times bigger than in the standard model. And so it's a pretty big difference. In the bottom case, it's five-thirds times uh, uh, the size in the standard model. So it can be very different than what it is in the standard model, but we will not know uh, at, at the LHC. And so this is one of the reasons, uh, as I said, one of the, uh, uh, one of the guaranteed uh, bits of physics that, that, that we will get in this case from, the, uh, from, from going to a 100 TV collider. Um, so <clears throat> let me show you another thing. Sorry, going back now. Uh, so here is a <clears throat> uh, picture of the level of precision in the couplings of the Higgs that are going to be reached. Um, now, uh, in this case, uh, at an E plus E minus Higgs factory versus what we will learn even asymptotically with the, all the data we'll gather at the LHC. Uh, the LHC is in gray, <clears throat> and what we'll get from the Higgs factory is in red. And so you see that across the board, uh, there's, a, there's a factor of 10, 20, 30, sometimes 50 increases in the, uh, in, uh, the precision that we're going to reach. The, 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 these guys at the bottom here is the uh, kappa b is the, is the uh, precision to which the coupling of the Higgs to bottom quarks will be measured. Um, this kappa z here is the most impressive of all, which is at around the, uh, at around the, uh, the point, point one percent level. Um, and so, but in almost all the cases, the level of precision is, uh, is less than a percent and a clear order of magnitude and sometimes better improvement. Uh, relative to what we'll get from the uh, LHC, so that that indicates the that indicates the um, uh, uh, just the power in probing Higgs physics. And let me just show you one more uh, example here. Um, yeah, so here's um, uh, this is showing uh, the the just the improvement in overall reach in going to a hundred TeV. Here you're looking at uh, uh, five sigma discovery of superpartners um, at the LHC, which is this black band here, uh, relative to what we might imagine at a 100 TV collider, which is this green one. Okay? And so you see that uh, <clears throat> this is uh, related to what I was talking before. Gluey nodes we can we might see up to sort of two two and a half uh, 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 TeV down here, um, but with a 100 TV collider here it can go up to 10 13. Uh, t sorry, uh, uh, 10, uh, 11 TeV for discovery, and almost up to 15 TeV for, uh, for exclusion. That's if you're just directly pair producing gluinos. Uh, if you have uh, more of the supersymmetric uh, spectrum, uh, then, then you, you get these uh, numbers going into the 20 TeV range uh, that I mentioned before. Um, uh, uh, again, compared to what we have down here from the LHC. So there's roughly a factor of five increase across the board um, in going uh, from the LHC to a possible 100 TV collider. Um, and <clears throat> there, there are even some, some quite dramatic cases um, uh, in various uh, versions of, uh, 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 interesting versions of supersymmetry, the first two generation um, uh, super partners can be heavy, they can be at 10, 20, 30 TeV, uh, we'll completely miss them at the LHC. Even if we produce the other particles, we'll make the gluinos, for example, we'll miss them at, at the LHC. Um, but one of the, but the, but the gluino could be still light. We could make the gluino, um, or we might, we may or may not make the gluino. Maybe even we slightly miss the, uh, the uh, gluino and it weighs uh, two, two, three TeV, whatever. Um, uh, well, one of the most uh, one of the um, most promising channels for producing uh, superparticles, even at the LHC, but also at 100 TeV, is uh, through this diagram that I've, I've shown here. It's uh, called associated production, where you have an up quark uh, and a gluon coming together through a gluino in the T channel and producing a gluino and a squark. In this case, if the gluino is light, 
<clears throat> but these squarks are, I mean, light means two or three TeV. But if the squarks are at, uh, are at 20 or 30 TeV, you could still produce them at 100 TeV collider. In fact, there's a reach for producing squarks almost up to 35 TeV uh, in association with a light gluino <clears throat> at, a, at 100 TeV collider. So those are just some illustrations. Um, uh, there is, um, uh, and, and finally, uh, um, in questions that have nothing to do with the naturalness, uh, but are just more directly motivated by the production of dark matter particles, let me just um, uh, show this uh, summary plot. Uh, 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 here is a, a very qualitative point that um, uh, dark matter could be weakly interacting particles. The weakly interacting particles annihilated with each other in the early universe so that only a small amount of it is left over today and makes up the, uh, makes up the dark matter. Uh, famously, if you ask what mass do these dark matter particles need to have if they are indeed interacting with the weak interactions, what mass do they have to have in order uh, to be dark matter? The mass that they need to have is somewhere near the TeV scale. And in fact, the formula, this is something worth uh, remembering, is that if the effective interaction strength, if the G squared is around normalized to be around 0.3, that's a reasonable strength that we have for the couplings in the standard model, then the mass of the dark matter particle would have to be around 2 TeV. So this is very important. Dark matter is not guaranteed to be, even if it's a WIMP, even if it's a weakly interacting particle, it's not guaranteed to have a mass of a few hundreds of GeV. In fact, if it's annihilating through just the ordinary standard model gauge interactions, uh, if the, if it's, uh, if the uh, amount of it left over from the Big Bang, the thermal relic abundance, uh, comes from those annihilations, its mass would have to be 1 or 2 or 3 TeV, not a few hundred G. And um, we, we've known that for a long time. Um, if possible for it to be hundreds of GeV, uh, but only in more, in more uh, if there are many more particles around, if in the more complicated um, uh, 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 scenarios, uh, but if it's just an electroweak charged particle, it's an electroweak doublet or an electroweak triplet, and the only interactions involved in its annihilations are uh, the standard model interactions, then the mass would have to be 1 or 2 or 3 TeV. And that's just not accessible to the LHC. Uh, the LHC is good for making colored particles, uh, 1 to 2 to 3 TeV, but uncolored particles may be from 2 to 400 GeV, as I said before. So uh, that's something else that we know ahead of time, that, that the LHC is just not going to uh, cover uh, even the meat of the parameter space for what would correspond to these simplest pictures of what WIMP dark matter could be. But if you go to a 100 TeV collider, uh, all the rates go up by the factor of 1,000, uh, um, uh, 100 to 1,000. Um, and so uh, if you want to have a powerful probe of one or two or three TeV electroweak particles, the 100 TeV proton-proton collider is a thing which is ideal for that. So you do get a factory, you know, uh, a huge rates for producing uh, uh, electroweak particles. And that's sort of summarized uh, in, this, uh, in this table, um, that there is a reach for producing uh, dark matter particles uh, again, in precisely the ranges that we are talking about. Um, and uh, the top two cases, Wino and Higgsino, uh, that, that really, means a, uh, really means an electric triplet and electric doublet, those are particularly simple and well-motivated possibilities. If you have an electric triplet particle, we, we know ahead of time its mass has got to be around 2.7, 2.8 TeV for it to be dark matter. Uh, if it's, uh, if it's an electric doublet like a Higgsino, we know its mass has got to be 1 TeV in order for it to be uh, uh, a thermal relic dark matter. And uh, those possibilities are, are almost completely covered uh, by the 100 TeV uh, collider. Um, so, and of course, uh, more interesting possibilities are, um, uh, 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 more, more interesting things are possible and everything makes them actually easier to see. Um, uh, the reason is that in these most minimal possibilities, the way you look for the dark matter, it's still pretty, it's still pretty indirect. You can't just collide uh, two partons and produce two dark matter particles and not see anything. Um, uh, there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's no signal, or just nothing. So, uh, so what you have to look for is, uh, is the uh, final state or initial state radiating uh, a jet uh, um, uh, or a photon. 
so you can look for jets plus uh, uh, a single jet plus missing energy, or a, pho or a photon plus missing energy, um, and uh, those are the those are the events which you can use to look for this uh, uh, dark matter. In the case where you're just directly pair producing the dark matter particle, that's the most difficult case. And even in that most difficult case, you can basically cover it um, with the 100 TeV collider. If it's more interesting, if you have a, a bunch of these particles, uh, if there's a sector of electroweak particles, and you produce a heavier one and it decays to a lighter one, uh, then things are much, much easier. And, but in any case, you, 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 you see from these plots, just from the axes, that it's the TeV scale that's showing up everywhere here. And so there is a robust probe of electroweak uh, particles up to, up to a TeV. All right, so, um, so um, I'll just finally uh, show you, just, just, just as I said before, this possibility is being taken seriously uh, um, uh, around the world now. And the proof of it is that um, there are pictures like this. These are pictures that particle physicists love to see of maps of the world with big circles on them, okay? So, uh, and here is a picture of, a, of the area around, uh, around Geneva. Um, and this is, uh, uh, there's the LHC, as you see, drawn. And uh, here's a, uh, a picture of where they're thinking of putting this uh, 80 or 100 kilometer long tunnel to host this facility. Uh, it'll have to go under the lake, which, is, uh, which will cause uh, some complications, but they'll, they'll, they'll manage to, uh, to do it, I'm sure. Um, and here's the analogous picture in China. Um, so, uh, so there's an area, I'm told it's, uh, uh, it's, it's 300 kilometers northeast of Beijing. Apparently it's right next to a beautiful beach and, um, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, it's, it's very pretty. Um, and I'm told there's no pollution, <laughs> um, but, th but there, 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 there's a picture. Here's a 50-kilometer tunnel and a 100-kilometer tunnel. Plenty of room here in Qingwandao uh, and actually strong interest and support from the local government um, to, uh, uh, to even help uh, build, um, uh, deal with all the infrastructure, uh, build the facility and, and, uh, and, and so on. So, um, so this, this, this project is being strongly thought about by the, uh, by, uh, by the people at CERN. Um, uh, uh, in China, uh, it's going to be uh, officially proposed to the government this year, um, to the Chinese government this year, and they're going to make some decision about it this year. Uh, now, they're likely not going to make a decision about whether to fund the whole thing on the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, right away, but they're making some decision about whether to fund uh, five years of a serious R&D effort. Um, and I think the sense of many people is that if they if they if they do decide that they're going to uh, uh, go ahead with the R&D, that's very that's very strong, very strong, serious indication uh, and support for the possibility that, that it will actually happen. Um, but anyway, that's uh, 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 that's 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 the decision that's being made um, uh, this year. Uh, so uh, we're going to have some uh, we're going to have some idea about uh, whether these machines will really become possible. I think uh, sooner uh, rather than later. And as I said, uh, part of the, my motivation for talking about all of this here is that if these things happen, this is the machine for your generation of people. Um, and uh, I think uh, it'll be enormously exciting, and um, uh, and uh, and you should find it uh, uh, exciting. Um, and um, uh, not only hope that it uh, uh, comes to fruition, but, but if it starts coming together, uh, it, um, it, it's uh, your generation of people who are going to have to think about all the great things that uh, it could do. So um, a final thing that I want to uh, talk about, um, whenever anyone talks about these big accelerators, uh, you always hear, oh my god, they're so expensive, how are we going to convince politicians to do these things, and so on. Um, in my experience, every time someone talks about having to convince politicians of something, it's, it's, it has nothing to do with the politicians. They're actually, they can't convince themselves. Um, uh, politicians have no idea what's, what's interesting or isn't interesting science and this and that. They have to rely on us to tell them what we find important and make a case uh, for why we want to do what, what we want to do. Um, uh, so, uh, so we should never uh, judge ahead of time uh, what their uh, response to these things are. In fact, it's our job to tell them what the response should be. Um, 
uh, and, uh, and then decide whether, you know, uh, our, uh, whether people want to actually go, go ahead and, um, and uh, give up the resources for doing this sort of thing. But if you want to know how much of these things cost, they cost 10 billion in whatever your favorite units of currency are. Okay? Um, but uh, while that might sound like a lot, this is a great, great plot. Uh, this is a great uh, figure. <clears throat> it shows that accelerators have always cost roughly the same amount. Um, and they cost always roughly 10 to the minus 4 of GDP. So, um, uh, for example, the LHC <coughs> costs around 3 10 to the minus 4 European GDP. LEP costs around 2 10 to the minus 4 European G, uh, uh, GDP. Th th this, this figure was made by, by my friends in, uh, in China talking about the cost of the project there. Um, uh, the, uh, in fact, uh, uh, China in 1984 built a, uh, built a very small electron-positron accelerator that they have in Beijing still. Uh, and that cost 10 to the minus 4 of Chinese GDP in 1984. Um, and uh, now, uh, now the electron positron Higgs factory that they're talking about would be around a half ten to the minus four. Um, the proton proton collider will be around ten to the minus four. Uh, so the cost is it's big. It's it's ten to the minus four of a GDP, but it's always been that big. We're not talking about anything which is particularly bigger now than 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 it was before. So I don't think there's an issue of cost or will or anything like that. Um, it's really uh, we, all of us, have to think about um, uh, 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 how excited we are about, uh, about the physics and tell um, uh, the people who make decisions how exciting the physics is, and then we'll see if, 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 uh, if humanity wants to keep this 100-year uh, quest going. But I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that, uh, that, that these things will actually become, uh, uh, will become a reality. So um, that's all I wanted to say. I think... Uh, uh, the, the, this is a very different lecture than the other ones that you've been uh, uh, that, that, that you've been hearing. Um, so you all know uh, that it's an incredibly exciting time in uh, uh, in all of these incredible formal developments that are going on in uh, in, a, in in our understanding of quantum field theory and string theory. Uh, I think in that direction, uh, there, there's there's so many remarkable things going on that to me it feels like an incredibly exciting time. Um, uh, something big is going on, and uh, it hasn't been uh, fully digested and, uh, and and understood, and no one knows what the big picture is yet. But uh, but um, uh, but there's obviously something uh, deep and important going on, uh, and it's uh, also a uh, uh, fantastically exciting period for exper for experiments, as I hope to have uh, convinced you. The next few years is probably the most important of the. Uh, entire uh, life of the LHC, at least when it comes to looking for physics beyond the standard model. And even the longer term um, uh, future of the experimental part of the field and thinking about uh, big accelerators uh, is something, something, something there, something that we can, uh, something we can think about and hope uh, uh, actually happens. Uh, and if it does happen, uh, these things aren't infinitely far away. You know, the, 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 uh, uh, these proton-proton machines could start I mean, if it happened at CERN, they could start in the in the mid 2030s. Um, the Higgs factory uh, that they're talking about in uh, in uh, China, uh, uh, if everything goes according to plan, that would be starting by the late 2020s, um, 2027, 2028. Um, if we have a, a linear collider in Japan, it would start even earlier than that. So we'd start getting somewhat earlier than that. So we'd start getting uh, information about uh, about about the Higgs there. So. Um, so there's things going on on, on, on all fronts. Um, and I'll just end with one just small piece of, uh, one small comment. Um, that, that, uh, this, is, uh, this is a school on, on uh, more uh, formal aspects of quantum field theory and, and, and string theory. Um, but, uh, but really, there, there's no such thing as formal theory and phenomenology and this part of cosmology and this and that. Uh, uh, in, in our field, especially for, for, for theorists in fundamental physics, there's just one subject, there's one big subject, it's called theoretical physics. And, um, and uh, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a broad and, and deep understanding 
of, uh, of the basics of a quantum field theory, you can do anything you want and move around from field to field and do any damn thing you want. Um, so, and I think that's actually going to be needed and perfect for the era that, that we're in. There's all sorts of things going on, purely theoretically, uh, in connection with experiments, uh, with colliders, with uh, dark matter experiments, with uh, cosmological observations. Uh, so it's really a perfect time to, to think broadly, but don't be a dilettante. Don't just uh, jump around from topic to, to a topic. Learn the basic uh, um, fundamentals of uh, quantum field theory uh, uh, as deeply as you can, and uh, and then and then move around to wherever your uh, your, uh, your your interests take you. Because this period we're in, I think, is absolutely perfect for broad and deep uh, youngsters to make uh, an enormous impact. So, all right, that's all. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks, Nima. All right. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, with uh, the available data from the CMS and ATLAS uh, teams, uh, how much they agree uh, uh, with the Higgs value? How much they agree between them? Oh, I mean, now, now that there, that, uh, earlier on there were little, there were little, little discrepancies in the mass of the Higgs and so on, but everything lines up perfectly right now. And they agree in a single peak, or yes, yes. All right. I mean, all of that stuff. Uh, uh, look, uh, early in any discovery, uh, um, and this is not just with the Higgs. If you go back with the everything, um, especially for particles that have that are somewhat expected. Um, uh, two things happen. First, the, the, the cross-section uh, with which it's discovered tends to be bigger than it actually turns out to be. Um, and this is a combination of luck and also being very aggressive by experimentalists because you, you're, you, you're, uh, you, you start seeing, seeing something. Uh, so that's um, also statistical fluctuations happen. So, so when, when the Higgs was first discovered, the, 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 its rate for uh, for being produced and decaying into, into two photons was maybe a factor of two bigger than the standard model. So a lot of people are like, wow, factor of two, this is a huge deal. But I think you know, anyone who sort of follows the history of particle physics knows that, that, that at, directly at discovery level, these factors of one and a half to uh, float around and uh, eventually uh, converge. And of course, right at the beginning, there was a little difference between the peaks. All that stuff is, is, is gone now. That there's a, that the Higgs is, is 125 and a bit GeV, and, and, and it's discovered at seven sigma, um, uh, and both experiments basically agree. Thank you. OK. Any other question or comment? Um, uh, uh, can I ask, uh, what's a particular reason to choose 100 TV, uh, TV or to like a 50? TV be enough or yeah that's uh, that's 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 a very good question um, uh, I think I think the the correct answer right now is that 100 TV is a nice round number um, it's it's sort of historically been the case that uh, that there are increases of about a factor of seven in energy from one hadron collider uh, to the next um, but uh, but the, uh, but that that's that's not a good reason so right now it's a right it's a nice round number um, and um, uh, what really needs to be done is for people to more carefully study what the physics potential is for 50 TeV, 100 TeV, 150 TeV, and see what it is that we, we really need, okay? Um, now, uh, and of course, many of us have spent the last year doing a lot of studies of this sort, uh, um, uh, uh, particularly for the, for the uh, effort in, uh, in uh, China. This last year, um, there was, uh, lots and lots of effort in China, around the world, amongst uh, uh, amongst uh, collider physicists, uh, uh, thinking about this this kind of question. Um, uh, it was more urgent because these studies needed to be done in time in order to make a case to the government uh, this year. Um, so, but in any case, so many of these preliminary studies have been done, and I think uh, I think 100 TV is looking um, uh, like it's more justified now. 
Um, because, for example, let, let's just uh, let's um, uh, uh, let's talk about um, the uh, uh, let's talk about the case of dark matter. Okay, so you want to you want to really robustly probe and, and, and exclude if it's uh, if you don't see it uh, the possibility that there's electroweak uh, charged particles who are the uh, dark matter. With 100 TeV, you're just doing it. Okay? And even there's, a, there's, some, there's still some little gaps. Um, with 50 TeV, you would be covering, I mean, the, the, it wouldn't be little gaps. With 50 TeV, you'd be covering you know, half of the parameter space, but not, uh, not, not really the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, um, uh, but, uh, but other than that, uh, but I think you know, we need more, more, more studies of that, of that sort. Um, uh, in order to have a, a, a clearer idea. But my, my, my guess is that uh, it'll, is that the sort of optimal thing will end up being not far from, a, from 100 TeV. Maybe it'll be 80. Um, uh, I suspect 50 will, will not be, uh, will, will, I mean 50 will leave you wanting for a number of these questions. Uh, I, I didn't have time to talk about this, uh, but let me just say that, um, that uh, we don't, I mean, you, you might wonder, how do we know what, what there is out there? So uh, we don't know what there is out there, so we have no idea for what energy we should be gunning at. It's true, it's, it's true that if we just see the Higgs and nothing else at the LHC, that we won't know what is out there. But there are well-defined physical questions, uh, and important physical questions, that, uh, that have to have an answer involving particles that are accessible um, uh, to these machines. And so, for example, that question is, what is the shape of the electroweak potential? Um, uh, that is something which, uh, uh, that, that is something that in order to get the answer to that question, uh, in order to know whether uh, the shape of the electroweak potential is qualitatively different from the one that we think of uh, uh, in the standard model, uh, if it is qualitatively different, the particles that are responsible for making qualitatively different, they can't be at and they can't be at uh, a million TeV. They have to be at the TeV scale if they're going to affect the shape of the potential. And they can't be too weakly coupled to the Higgs. Otherwise, again, they won't affect uh, the story at all. So, so if you want to ask the question, you know, if there are particles that affect the, the structure of the, uh, of the electric phase transition so strongly as to even change its order, change it from second order to first order, um, that's something that we'll have no idea about at the LHC. But let's say you want to settle that question. Uh, is the electric phase transition first order or second order? You want to you know, robustly probe and settle that question. That gives well-defined targets of, uh, of uh, couplings, uh, uh, strengths uh, to measure to the Higgs, uh, masses to look for of new particles at the, at, at the high energy collider. And you know, more detailed studies like that are going to be needed to get the answer, uh, to get the sharp answer to the question. But, but I think what we're seeing in all these preliminary studies is that 100 TeV is not, is not like gravy, and you could already do with 70. 100 TeV just seems to be just about what, what, what you'd actually want. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank Nima again.